Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Hallelujah. Praise God. Our hearts are warmed up as we begin to celebrate Black History Month. Praise God. Celebrating heroes of the past and present. Amen. Who have fought the good fight for freedom and for liberty and for equal opportunities for all. Praise God. And it's so appropriate for us to celebrate our heroes in the worship service because God is the one who has seen us through and continues, praise God, to see us through. So we're going to celebrate all month this very important heritage, our black history heritage. And uh, the Lord is going to truly open our hearts and our eyes more and more as we celebrate. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, we're also celebrating February birthdays. So everyone who is born in the month of Febru February, we wish you a warm, blessed, prosperous, happy birthday. Praise God. Praise God. We hope that you enjoy your day and this coming year to the fullest. Praise God. All right. We're going to get ready for worship and uh, we're going to pray and, and get ready for worship. Let's bow our heads and talk to God at this time. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for you have brought us thus far. We thank you, O oh God, that you have not left us, that you have not forgotten us, O oh Lord, but that you continue to show your grace and your mercy, O oh God. And we believe in that dream, O oh Lord, that we shall see the promised land. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, O oh God. And Lord, we ask that you'll bless our worship service at this time. Let your spirit go from heart to heart and drive home the word of hope today and we'll give your name all the praise for we ask it in Jesus name amen amen in honor of black history month let's hear a modern arrangement of a classic negro spiritual brought to us by the Jason Max Fernand singers he's got the whole world in his hand
For learning with fun facts about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for kids. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an American Baptist minister, activist, humanitarian, and also known for being the leader of the African American Civil Rights Movement. Dr. Martin Luther King was born in Atlanta, Georgia on January 15th in 1929. Now, the world knows him today as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but his name wasn't always Martin. He was actually born and given the name Michael by his father. But that all changed during a trip to Germany where the theologian Martin Luther impressed Dr. Martin Luther King's father so much that he changed his name and his son's name too. Now, when it came to education, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was very smart. That's right. When he was a kid, he literally skipped two grades, the 9th and the 11th, to enter Morehouse College at the young age of 15 in 1944. Later on, Dr. King entered Boston University. There, he completed his schoolwork in 1953, earning a doctorate in systematic theology two years later. Also, while he was there, he met his love, Coretta Scott. That's right, Coretta Scott was a young singer from Alabama who was studying at the New England Conservatory of Music. They later got married in 1953. Not long thereafter, he got involved in the Civil Rights Movement, taking part in the Montgomery bus boycott after Rosa Parks had been arrested for not going to the back of the bus after the bus driver told her she couldn't sit at the front. Of course, many know Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from taking part in the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, where his world-famous I Have a Dream speech set a fire to the civil rights movement that can still be echoed today of people wanting freedom and wanting to be treated equally. From there, his name only grew, and in 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Sadly, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life was cut short, being assassinated on April 4, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, while standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. Although the nation was sad, the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would still ring loud today. The hard work that he did during the Civil Rights Movement would soon be listened to, and that's when the Civil Rights Act was passed by Congress. And although many celebrated his birthday around the country in multiple cities, at the White House Rose Garden on November 2nd, 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed a bill creating a federal holiday to honor Dr. King's works. And those were fun facts about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Hi everyone, my name's Kaylin Morris. Martin Luther King Jr. was an um, African-American Baptist minister and activist who became the most visible leader in the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. has earned the right to be one of our heroes because he used his voice to speak up for what was right in a time where people were treated badly because of their skin color. A long time ago, America promised that all its people would be treated equally, but through history, that promise has been broken. I'm so happy that God used MLK to remind America that all people are created equally. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon and speeches 
remind us that God's promises are true. No matter what it looks like, that's why we must always have courage. Bye kids, happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that children's story today. What a wonderful lesson. And right on time to get us ready for prayer, praise God. We know that God is a God who hears and answers our prayers. And I wanna encourage somebody out there, you may be going through a rough time, I don't know what it could be, maybe in your family, maybe your finances, maybe at work. Whatever cares you are experiencing right now, God is in it. God is working in it. He's working through it. Hold on to the Lord. He is answering your prayers. Praise God. And he's listening. So we're going to bring our burdens to the Lord at this very time. We're remembering families who are bereaved, who have lost loved ones, certainly those who are sick. Uh, those who have been displaced. Uh, we remember uh, situations all around the world, the, the issue there in Ukraine and Russia, and, and all of these things that are around us that seem so huge, out of our control, but God, hallelujah, is in control. So let's talk to our God at this time as Elder Emmanuel Njoku leads us before the throne. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs Magnify the Lord, all you saints of Seabrook. Come and exalt his name on high. For our God, he is mighty in battle. He has delivered us from all snares of the enemy this past week. Father God, we come asking for cleansing. Cleansing from all unrighteousness. Anything that is unlike you, Father God, we ask that you would take it away. That our worship today may be received at your throne. Father, we come bearing some requests. You know, we have struggled and is still struggling with this sickness that has besieged this world, this COVID-19. Father God, we still have folks that are struggling with it. Folks that are infected right now or on their way of recovery. We thank you for those that you have brought through this trial. Father God, you created these bodies and you know exactly how to fix them. And so we come to you, our great physician, bearing that truth that you will save us. Father God, we also continue to pray for those who are having mental issues, all sorts of depression, anxiety, restlessness, spirit of unforgiveness, heartbreaks, and Father, generational curses. We ask today that you will break them you are the Father that restores even the mind, that restores even the brokenhearted. Father God, we come to you today asking for these blessings. We continue to pray for our relationships, especially those of the husbands and the wives, those of the parents and their children, and those of the siblings. Father, you know how important it is to have these relationships as they are the fabric of our society, continue to heal our families, continue to heal our relationships. We continue to uh, lift up the families that are bereaved. Um, the list is just too long, Father God, but you know who these families are. And we just ask that you will send that Holy Spirit to comfort them, especially at this time. Father, today you have chosen again Pastor Johnson to break the bread of life. Continue to work with him speak through him that we may receive the word from you today and when it's all said and done father we will give you and continue to give you all the glory all the praise for you are worthy for you are our god and our god alone in jesus name we pray amen
Thank you, Ellen Joku, for that prayer. Praise God. Praise God. I want to talk to you about our growth groups. And I, I want you to I want you to really hear me now. Growth groups are not just another program that uh, you check out and maybe it does you some good. We found growth groups to be life changing. And what are growth groups? Growth groups are groups of 10, 15 to 20 people who gather together weekly for 60 to 90 minutes each week for fellowship and discussion of the word together on various topics. And we have seen and we've heard testimony after testimony of people whose lives have literally changed for the better as a result of being a part of a growth group. People who have changed their whole approach to finances and are saving more. People who have made uh, changes in their work life so that they could spend more time with their families. People whose marriages have turned around because they've been a part of a couple's growth group. We've seen so many life changes in growth groups. And I want you to have the opportunity coming up very soon to be a part of one of these life-changing growth groups. Uh, you can go to our website, go to our websites, click on growth groups, and you'll be taken to a catalog where you will see a variety of groups. There's got to be a group in there that you're interested in. Many of them are virtual. There are a few of them that are in person. We encourage you right now, right now, even this very moment, to click on the website, visit our catalog, and choose a growth group with an, a topic that interests you or a time and day that you can truly attend. And you will not be sorry, you will not be sorry that you have attended a growth group. I guarantee you, you're going to experience a blessing when you join a growth group today. Our growth groups are filling up, so we don't want you to delay. We want you to join a growth group at this very moment. So take a moment, take a moment, even as I'm talking, it's all right, it's not rude. I want you to do it even while I'm talking right now. Click on the website, go to growth groups, look at the catalog and choose your group. You'll be signed up today and ready, ready to experience life-changing blessings in a growth group. We're gonna now have our scripture reading by Melody Bell. Happy Sabbath! Today, our scripture reading comes from Hebrews 6, 9-12, the New King James Version. And it reads, But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God bless you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our music this morning is provided to us by John Stoddard. Many of you may know John as a successful recording artist, musician, producer, and songwriter, but you may not know that John is a former Seabrook musician. That's right, John played here at Seabrook for several years when Pastor Phipps was the pastor. And John was more than willing to provide us with this selection this morning uh, that ties in perfectly with the message that Pastor Johnson is going to bring. So listen and be blessed. This song I'd like to share with you is an old song. It's uh, probably going to be familiar to many of you. Um, and I decided to share it, my own interpretation of it, uh, because uh, there's something about going back and grabbing uh, things that are old and proven. You know, uh, we live in times that feel really unstable and uncertain. And uh, it's just nice to go back and reconnect with those songs that um, reaffirm God's sovereign power. Um, the fact that none of what's happening in our lives and in our world is catching God by surprise. Um, and that no matter how it seems, God has the world 
And even perhaps more importantly, he has us in the palm of his hand. So uh, I hope the words of this song uh, bless you. It's Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing your grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me ever to adore Thee. May I still Thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. raise my Ebenezer Tither by your help I've come And I hope by Thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Sword me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, mm -hmm. he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. constrained to be and let thy goodness like a feather bind me closer Lord to thee prone to wonder Lord I feel it Above, I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for your courts, your courts above. Seal it for your courts above. Seal it for your courts above.
Praise the Lord for that blessed selection by John Stoddard. Thank you, John. You warmed our hearts and got us ready for the word today. Praise God. And for the word, we're going to Hebrews chapter six. I praise God for that blessed message that was preached last week by Pastor Natalie Roberts. Uh, and now we're in chapter six, Hebrews chapter six. So if you'll go there in your in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter six, and we're going to read verses nine through twelve. Hebrews chapter six, verses nine through twelve. Let's pause and say a word of prayer. God, we thank you and praise you. Thank you for your word, O God. And now, Lord, bless our minds with understanding and our hearts to receive that we might be changed in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Verse nine. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your works and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The sixth chapter of Hebrews speaks a lot about promises. The word promise or promises is mentioned four times throughout the chapter. The word swear is used three times and the word oath twice, all in a relatively short 12 verses of this chapter. Clearly, the author wants to communicate something very strongly about promises. In fact, the people of God are referred to as heirs of the promise in this chapter. And that is because the aim of the author in chapter six is to keep the people of God believing in a promise that was made 4,000 years before their time. And that is really one of the main problems with promises. <laughs> one of the most aggravating things about promises is that if they are fulfilled, they are usually not fulfilled right away. I know someone can bear witness to that today. Let me say it again. One of the big problems with promises is that they normally are not fulfilled immediately, which means that often we have to wait for promises to be fulfilled. Are you following today? You see, a promise is a declaration that someone will do something, future tense. And, and no matter how strong that declaration is, promises are really just statements of intent. When a person says, I promise, they're really saying, I have every intention to pay you back. Or I have every intention of getting help so that I'm not abusive towards you. Or I have every intention uh, of following through. I have every intention of paying my bill. I have every intention of resolving the thing uh, you paid me to fix. So, so promises, no matter how vehement we are in making our promises, really are only statements of intent. The big problem with promises is that if, and that's a capital if, if they are fulfilled, they are normally not fulfilled right away. Uh, and, and so we, have, we find ourselves having to wait. We find ourselves, when, when we're uh, promised something, we find ourselves having to wait for that promise to materialize. And it's even more problematic when we're waiting in suffering. When we're waiting in pain for a promised relief or resolution to our suffering, that's when it becomes more critical. You're in the emergency room and the emergency attendant 
promises you that you will be seen. But in the meantime, you're sitting in discomfort and pain waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. Somebody knows what I'm talking about out there. And that's where the Hebrews found themselves. Here in chapter 6, verse 18 says that they have fled for refuge. You go to chapter 10 and it describes them as having endured a great struggle with suffering. They were reproached and made spectacles. This is the audience that the author of Hebrews is writing to. They, they endured a great struggle with suffering. They were reproached and, and made spectacles. And yet they were promised that Christ would come and save and rescue them but in the midst of their trials, in the midst of their persecution, it seems like that promise is at best distant or at worst empty. They've been promised that they have an inheritance, that they're going to inherit a kingdom. They're going to inherit a home in glory, in paradise. But instead, their homes here are being confiscated. Their property is being taken by the state. The, the problem with promises is that they usually are not fulfilled instantly if they are fulfilled at all. Someone out there has experienced the problem of promises. Some of us are still waiting on a friend or, or a neighbor or a family member or a business or a country to fulfill its promises. Somebody out there was promised you in your time of trial, in your time of need, a friend or a neighbor said, oh, I know people I can call. Oh, I have expertise in this. I'm going to help you out. And you're still waiting for that person to call you back or return your text. The problem with promises, if they are fulfilled, normally they take a while. Some of us have been promised, there's somebody out there, you were promised years ago that somebody who's going to love you and cherish you in sickness and in health, in prosperity and adversity, till death do you part. And you still, 20 years later, waiting for this love and this cherishing to show up in your relationship. The problem with promises is that if they are fulfilled, they take a while sometimes. I read somewhere about a promise that was made way back in 1870 called the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And 95 years later, people of color had to fight, get their teeth knocked out, heads bashed in, dogs biting them, hoses turned on them, locked up in prison, fighting for the country to honor its promise made 95 years ago. And here we are, in 2022, 150 years after the promise was originally made, and we're still fighting for equal opportunity voting for all. The problem with promises is that if they are fulfilled at all, they normally are not fulfilled right away. And let me tell you a bigger problem. Oh, I know. I'm going to get to the good news, but I got I to gotta make sure you understand the issue with promises. Here's the bigger issue with promises. Promises are only as good as the one making them. Hello, y'all. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> let me say it again. The biggest issue with promises is the capability or the credibility of the one making the promise. You see, the, 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 the reason that promises fail, the reason that promises 
can't truly sometimes be reliable is because the person making the promise is not reliable. And, and let me just lay out here, real right, right here, right now, Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you belong in the category of a human being, you all lousy in promise keeping. <laughs> Jesus said, look, if you're a human being walking on this earth, don't even make promises. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, because you're all limited in your capability to keep promises. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. Case in point, I can, I can promise you tomorrow I'm going to pay you with the fullest intention. Could have the money right there in my house. I could promise you I'm going to pay you tomorrow, but I could die today. Hello, somebody. And, and, and that's the plight that we're in as human beings. Truly, we are limited in our capability to be promise keepers by the very fact of life, by the very fact that I, I can promise you in the next hour I'm going to fulfill a promise and I, don't, I can't even guarantee my next breath. So how can I guarantee you? We, we are naturally limited in our capacity to keep promises. Are you with me today? That is why when, when, when people make promises, when institutions, when businesses, and when governments make profit, don't hold your breath. Hello, somebody out there. Don't hold your breath. Because we are all, as human beings, limited in our capacity to keep promises. Some of us have seen that time and time and time again. Some of us, of us have been hurt and scarred by broken promises. Some of us, our lives have taken a different turn because of promises that weren't honored. Some of us as children have grown up with, with bruises and with hurt in our heart because of promises that did not come through or that were not failed. The problem with promises is that if they are fulfilled, they normally take a while. And, and it depends on the capability and credibility of the one making the promise. Oh, but I know one. <laughs> there is one. Hello, somebody out there. There is one. See, I, li I like to get to the good news. I, I love, I wish I could just breeze right on through the bad news and just get right to the good news. But the good news, hallelujah, is that there is one who is both capable and credible enough to make and keep promises. Does anybody know who I'm talking about out there today? I, I, let me just say it again. There, there is one, not two, one, hallelujah, who is capable and qualified and credible enough to make and keep promises. Can I read about him in chapter 6? And I'm going to go to verse 13. Look at it. Verse 13, and we'll look through 17. Now listen, pay attention to the word now. you got to follow it and, and let it sink in. For when God, when who? When God, not when the president, not when Congress, not when a politician, not when the church, but when God, hallelujah, made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Did y'all hear that today? Verse 14 saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Hallelujah. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God, verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Hello, y'all. Let me, let me try to translate this or, or make, break this down to you. See, when, when a person, you know this, you've heard people do this, when a person wants to really convince you that their word is bond, that, that their promise is true, you hear people say things like, I swear on my mother's grave or my grandmother's grave or 
I swear on the very lives of my children, or I, I swear on everything I own. I put it on everything that I own. Because they're trying, they're, they're, they're swearing by something that is of utmost importance, so that is greater than themselves, so that they can convince you how steady and how firm their promise is. Well, when God wanted to reassure his people that his word is bond, when God wanted to make us absolutely certain that his promises are true, God looked around and said, what could I swear on? <laughs> and he couldn't find nobody, couldn't find nobody greater, nobody higher, nobody more faithful, nobody more worthy. Come on, nobody more reliable, nobody more powerful. Hello, somebody out there. So God said, I'm going to put this promise on my swell. I swear on my own life. Hallelujah. God laid his own existence, his own eternal existence on the table so that you and I could be assured that we can take his promise of peace, his promise of prosperity and joy and victory and salvation to the bank. We can be sure that his promises are true and certain. Hallelujah. And, and, and immutable. God said, I swear by my own self, praise God, that the promise I'm making to you will come to pass. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what storms you're going through. But my promise shall come to pass in your life. Somebody ought to rejoice on that today. Ha! Hallelujah. God said, I put it on myself. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 says that God wants us to have strong consolation. In other words, God wants there to be no shadow of a doubt in our mind. God wants there to be no question mark. God wants there to be no fuzziness of how certain and how firm his promises are to us. And, and why? Why did God feel the need to be so drastically convincing about the certainty of his promises in Hebrews chapter six? Well, first of all, because he knew he knew that somebody watching this worship service today is so tangled up in some mess that you 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 can't even imagine a time when a promise of deliverance will be fulfilled in your life. I mean, you, you, just, you just got so many things cornering you on every side. You don't see any way out. You just cannot see how a promise of liberty and deliverance could really materialize in your life. God wanted you to know that even in the midst of your captivity, even though you cannot see your way out, the promise of deliverance is going to occur in your life. Be encouraged today. God, God wrote this in Hebrews chapter six because he wanted to strengthen somebody's faith. Praise God. He wanted you to know that the, somebody who's who's going through some troubles and trials right now. And I know there are many out there who are going through some things, maybe in your family. I don't know. Maybe in, in, in your in your own mental space, going through some things that you cannot you can't even conceive of a time when a promise of joy and peace can be fulfilled in your life. I mean, you, you can't even see it. All you see is the trouble around you. All you see is after you get after this one, then there's another one coming. And after that one, there's another one coming. And then there's something on this side. And that's something on that side. I know what we're talking about. I know that feeling. But God is, has written Hebrews 6 to encourage somebody, even though you're cornered all the way around. I, I do not want you to lose sight that the promise of victory, the promise of peace, hallelujah, the promise of rest will come to pass because God said it. Hallelujah, somebody. I want you to be encouraged today and to claim that in your heart. Thank God for Hebrews chapter six. 
But there's another reason why God was so adamant in, in convincing us here in Hebrews 6 that his promises are sure. There's another reason why he put in there, hey, I swear on myself, on my own eternal existence, that my word is true. He, he, there's another reason that he wants to be so convincing in Hebrews 6, and that is because he wants to strengthen your faith, my faith, in the credibility and the capability of the promise maker. Hello, somebody. He wants, I'm going to say it again. He wants to strengthen your faith in the credibility of the promise maker. You see, God knew that the enemy would come along and would try to paint an unjust picture of God as one who makes promises to some people, but not to others. Oh, he knew. He knew that the enemy would come and present a, a picture of an unjust, an unjust God who makes the inheritance available to some, to a few, but not to you. He, he knew that the enemy would come and paint God as someone who says, hey, the promise is not for you. The promise is just for those folk. You're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You're, you're not built for this. You're not made to receive the blessings of this promise. The promise is just for them. God knew that the enemy would come along and would erect a false God that is unjust. And so God said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I need you to understand that my promises are true. They are for all who believe. As a matter of fact, here's how God responds to that. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. Look at it. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. Look at it. Watch this. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Hello, somebody. I, I want you to catch that right there. Let me see the, read it again. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor, hallelujah, of love, which you have shown toward his name. Now, let me tell you something about this right here. This truth right here, that God is not unjust to forget you, this truth, whether you know it or not, is what carried slaves through centuries of slavery in this country. This truth right here is what caused freedom fighters to push on through the Jim Crow era and, and through persecution. This truth that God is not unjust to forget you. Slaves had to look past the fake unjust God that the master forced down their throat. They had to look past a God who said, who said, uh, you are made to be slaves. You belong in the predicament you're in. You're supposed to serve. Obey your master. Please your mistress. And you might make it to heaven, but don't think for a minute that you're going to walk with your master and your mistress. But there will be a wall and a little hole in the wall so that you can see your mistress and your master. But you will not walk with them. But the slaves, hallelujah, had faith enough to look past that false God and say that's not God <laughs> God is not unjust to forget me and my plight down here God is a merciful God a compassionate God a, a, a gracious God a good God that's not my God oh hallelujah somebody out there thank God Freedom fighters in the civil rights era, they had to look past the, the, the unjust, phony, hateful God that was presented to them by many Christians in this country. They had to look past that false image, praise God, that, that image, that God that was presented to them that said, hey, God ordained the separation of the races. God cursed you. So you're supposed to be inferior. You're supposed to be segregated. You are not supposed to enjoy the rights of others. They looked 
past that phony God and said, we know our God. He is not unjust to forget us. I don't care how many, how many of these, these, uh, 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 distorted little figures and images of Jesus you put up to keep us subdued and, and, and try to tell us to accept our plight. We know our God. He is not unjust. Praise God to forget us, but his promises are to all who believe black, yellow, brown, and white, Jew, and Gentile. Praise God. His promises are true and for all. Hallelujah, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, praise God. Thank God for that truth that God is not unjust. And my friends, we made it through because we constantly look past the false gods that were papered in front of us and projected in front of us and taught in front of us that said we're supposed to be in slavery. We're supposed to be inferior. We're supposed to be separate and unequal. And we said, no, 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 no. That is not God. God is a just God. No respecter of persons. A God who loves all, hallelujah, of his children. I love what Frederick Douglass said. He said, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Oh, my friends, I want to tell you, when you know your God and you have faith in the credibility of God, then you understand that his promises are sure and they are for you. Hallelujah. If you believe, Praise God. I need somebody when the enemy is trying to paint an unjust picture of God in your life. Oh, look how long you've been praying. God hasn't answered your prayer. Look how long your loved one has been sick and they still sick. You've been praying for healing. Look, look you lost your loved one. They passed. Didn't you pray? Didn't you stay up all night and pray? Where is God? When the enemy tries to paint your God as an unjust God, you ought to do like those old slaves and look past that false image and say, oh no, my God is not unjust to forget me. He's still righteous. He's still merciful. He's still long suffering. He's still compassionate. He's still all powerful. He's still gracious. He's a good God. Oh, hallelujah, somebody out there. Oh, we got to learn, praise God, to look past the false images that the world presents to us of God. I don't care if it's Christian or not. And recognize, praise God, the word of God declares who God is. God who loves justice and mercy and grace. Hallelujah. Don't let the enemy fool you with a false representation of God. He is not unjust to forget you, praise God. You are in the promise. Now, I got to read one more thing before we go. One more thing. We're going back to verse 10. We're going to read just verse 10 and 11. I want you to get something out of this before we leave. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Again, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Did y'all hear that? You have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire, listen, that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Let me translate these verses. It's simply saying that we're not waiting for the promise. We're not merely waiting for the promise. We are participating in the promise. Mm. Oh, I need that to sink in. I need you to catch that 
and I need you to hold that. Let me say it again. What these verses are saying is that not, we're not merely passively waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. We are actively participating in the promise. He said, you have ministered and do minister, and I want you to show the same diligence. See, my friends, we need to throw away the victim gospel. Oh, this, this, this representation of Christians that, oh, we just, we just sitting around in woe and misery and bemoaning the circumstances of the world and all around us. And we're just waiting for that promise to come about. Now we're just crying. It, it makes us look pitiful in the eyes of the world when we present ourselves as just woe makers. Oh, Oh, what's so wrong with the world? Everything's so wrong around. Oh, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for that one day for the promise to be fulfilled. No, my friends, the word is saying we're not just waiting. We are participating in the promise. Hello, somebody. When we serve our neighbors, we are participating in the promise. When we invite them into relationship with God most high, we are participating in the promise. When we empower them to reach others for God, we are participating in the promise. When you're in that classroom and you're not just teaching science and algebra and English, but you're encouraging students that they can achieve all that God has put in their heart to achieve, you are participating in the promise. When we're learning how to be good stewards of our finances, praise God, and not spending and throwing our money at everything that the world throws at us, praise God, but we're harnessing the power of what God has given us for good and for future generations. We are participating in the promise. Hallelujah. When we're teaching our children, praise God, and, and spending time with them and leaving a legacy for them and training them, praise God, to respect God. Hallelujah. Respect themselves and, and to be industrious and know how to make decisions. We are participating in the promise of God. When you use the creativity that God has placed in your mind and in your hands to build things and to build businesses and to write and, and to create, praise God, we are participating in the promise of God. We ain't just laying back, laying in the mud, laying in sackcloth and ashes and bemoaning all that's going on around us. Oh God, we just wait, 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 wait for you to come so you can take us out of this messed up life and messed up world. No, my friends, we are heirs of the promise. We are participants in the promise. We are partners with God in the promise. We are walking, hallelujah, and running in the promise. And when the world sees us, when our family members who are not in the Lord see us, when people around us see us, they should not see somebody who's walking around with their jaws hung down, but they should see somebody who is living in the promise of God, who is claiming with their footsteps, hallelujah, and their hands, hallelujah, the promises of God, who are announcing through their life that the promises of God are real, hallelujah. We are partners with God in the promise. We're walking, hallelujah, not waiting, but walking in the promise of God. Like Harriet Tubman said, hallelujah, if you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If you hear them shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. And Hebrews chapter 6 is saying, I do not want you to be weary, but keep going. Keep walking in the promise. Keep living in the promise. Keep moving and acting and participating in the promise. Somebody today, you're tired of waiting. 
the promise has not been fulfilled yet in your life and, and, and you, you find yourself in that, in that sackcloth and ashes kind of mindset. Oh, woe is me. Woe is the world. Woe is everything around me. I don't even know if this promise is going to be fulfilled. My friends, the challenge today from the word of God, change that mindset. It says, no, 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 get up and keep going. Keep serving, keep teaching, keep leading, praise God. Keep preaching, keep talking, keep sharing. Hello, somebody. Keep educating, keep educating yourself. Keep going. Keep walking in the promise. And God assures us on his own eternal life. That the promise will be fulfilled. I have more than a dream today. <laughs> I've got a promise from God that I will see, hallelujah, the land and the freedom and the victory and the salvation that God has promised me. Does anybody want to join me as a participant in the promise of God today? Wherever you are right now, we're just going to pray a prayer. Praise God. And maybe that's a decision for you. Maybe that's a decision. That's a decision for you because you've been on a course where you've just been laying up in self-pity or in, in, in woe or feeling like you just can't move, immobilized by whatever is going on in your life. But today you're making up your mind. I'm walking in the promises of God today. That's your desire. Let's pray on this thing. Let's pray on it. Maybe somebody, that's a decision for you to go to our website, to our next step, uh, click on our next step, and you'll see a number of decisions there. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe that's your walking forward in the promise or counseling or special prayer, whatever it is. Maybe it's a decision right now you're just making your heart, and you and God know what that is. I want to invite you now to join me in prayer. Thank you, God that you are not unjust to forget me. You haven't left me out of the inheritance. You haven't left me out of the promise. And Lord, I can rest assured that no matter what's going on in my life, no matter how unclear the way seems, no matter how crowded the path is, your promise is certain. It will come to pass. That promise of peace that promise of eternal joy, that promise of triumph will come to pass and nothing can stop it. Help me to see through the false representations of an unjust God that have been held up in front of me and see right through it and see my just God <laughs> who cares about all of his children and who has an inheritance for us all. Clear the way in my mind, clear the way in my heart to receive and claim and accept, but not only that, live and walk in the promise. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We're walking in the promises. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're walking in it. We're living in it. Praise God. We're moving in it. Even the way that we handle our money, it, it's promised money. Come on, somebody. It's inheritance money. <laughs> we, we treat it like inheritance, like God has blessed us with it so that we can advance his kingdom and his promises in this world and extend his promises Hallelujah to other people. We are in the business of not only saving souls, but lives, praise God, in this world. Uh, and praise God, God is enabling us to do that, to reach families, to help families in tangible ways, even families who are going through crisis. Amen. We've been on the spot with families who've lost their homes or or who've lost their jobs and and God has enabled us to be a support to families and that is because of your generous giving so we just praise God and thank God for you 
And look, we want to make 2022 a year where we are over and abundant, over and abundant in our ability to help and to serve our neighbors. And you can help us do that by continuing, praise God, and even more, continuing to give to the cause of God. You can go to our website right now, click on give, and you'll be taken to uh, various options where you can give. And uh, then there's also uh, Cash App and Venmo and Zelle, and you can give on, on either of those platforms. Or just go to our website and give. And God is going to bless. God is going to bless you. God's going to bless those whom he has under his umbrella who are going to receive from what you are giving. Let's pray over our gifts today. God, you're such a good God. Thank you. Thank you that your promises are sure. Your word is true. And so, Lord, we know that when you say you will pour out a blessing upon us, uh, Lord, as we give unto you, we know that it is sure. So now, God, uh, just bless us as we give gifts unto you, our offerings and our tithes and our contributions unto you. And Lord, take it, magnify it, O oh God, and bless many, many, many lives as a result of our giving. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. We want you to have a blessed, blessed week. And remember, walk in the promises. Praise God. We're not waiting. <laughs> We're walking in the promises. God bless you. Pathfinder's friendly reminder that your supply kit pickup is taking place today from 1 to 3 o'clock p.m. at the Seabrook Church parking lot. Your club meeting will take place tomorrow at 9 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. Adventurers, please note that your club meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock a.m. will be held in person and will resume as in-person meetings unless notified otherwise. For questions regarding Pathfinder or Adventurer meetings, please contact your team leader. Your 2021 annual giving statement is now available through our online platform, CCB. If you donated a tither offering to our church, online or via a giving envelope, we've already created a CCB account for you and you can download your statement using the six easy steps listed on the screen. Don't worry, if you don't know your password, just click on Forgot Password and you'll be provided further guidance to access your account. For questions regarding your giving statement, please contact treasurer at seabrooksda.org. If you've been longing for fellowship or maybe need a boost to grow your faith, you definitely want to sign up for Spring 2022 Growth Group, which begins the week of February 20th. We have 20 different classes to choose from, and sessions are available throughout the week to fit your busy schedule. All classes are free and open to everyone, so make sure to invite a friend. You can find a full class catalog with course descriptions and session details on our church website. Are you ready to join the crew? If you're between the ages of 13 to 18 and are interested in joining Friday Night Live, our virtual teen discussion group, we invite you to go to our youth page on seabrooksda.org to learn more and sign up for online access details. Thanks for joining us today and we hope to see you again. You can find our live stream every Saturday at 10 o'clock a.m. for Bible study and 11 o'clock a.m. for praise and worship. We also love connecting with you, so make sure to find us on Facebook and YouTube and browse through our website, seabrooksda.org, to find a ton of events and resources available to you and your entire family. We look forward to seeing you, but until then, from our family to yours, God bless.